Good evening, Lighthouse family and friends. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to welcome you to our Thursday night Bible study with Pastor G. And if you haven't guessed yet, I'm Pastor G. No, but on a serious note, I thank God for every single one of you. Um, thank you for taking the time um, and tuning in. Um, today, today we will cover... chapter 6 verse 8 through chapter 7 verse 60 yes that is a large uh, range of text to cover I will not read it all I will not read it all I'm going to read two main parts um, and then in our conversation today I'm going to discuss those parts that are in between but saying all of that before we hop into our Bible text Let's go to the word in prayer. Father God, I thank you um, for today, Lord. You have kept us today. Um, you saw fit to wake us and keep us throughout today. So Lord, we are grateful in that. Um, always remembering the Bible text where it states that th th this is the day. Today is the day that you have made. Lord, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, I thank you for everyone who is tuning in on today and everyone that will watch later. Um, Father, it is my prayer that by your spirit that you give us clarity um, and understanding of your word. Um, so again, Father, I just ask that you remove all distractions, any distractions that would be going on right now, um, Lord, and help us keep our attention tuned to you, Lord, so that we can, may gain understanding um, of this Bible text and how it fits um, within the context of the book of Acts and how the book of Acts fits within the context of the Bible as a whole. And Lord, lastly, uh, my request to you is that you will continue to teach us to be better doers of your word and not just hearers. So Father God, we thank you and we bless you. We ask all of these things in the name of your son, Christ Jesus. And if you are in agreement with that, that is a place for you to say amen. Again, um, we will be covering the book of Acts chapter six, verse eight through chapter seven, verse 60. Chapter six, verse eight through uh, chapter seven, verse 60. If you would take your, um, to your attention to verse 8 of chapter 6, I will read um, verses 8 through 15, verses 8 through 15. And the Bible reads, and again, I'm reading from the ESV. The Bible reads, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs amongst the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenes and of the Alexandrians and those from Cilicia and Asia rose up and disputed with Stephen. Verse 10, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak the words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Today, um, in these sections that we're going to cover, um, we're going to look at three things today, or we will see three things upon completion of these sections. The first thing is we're going to look at the man Stephen. We're going to look at the man Stephen, his character, how he was looked at and how Luke described him. Secondly, we're going to look um, further in the text. I have not read that part yet, but we're going to look at the aftermath of Stephen's speech. Um, if you all are up on your reading, we'll see that um, after this, Stephen has to defend himself um, in front of the council. And we discussed this, the, who the council was last week, but we'll go over it again. But we see, um, secondly, we're going to see the aftermath of Stephen's defense um, to the council. And then lastly, um, these sections, it's important to note that Luke directs his attention away from the apostles and focuses on Stephen. Um, and then by doing that, um, Luke also, as he does um, throughout the text, 
um, throughout the book of Acts. Um, this is his way of how he's going to introduce to us another character um, by the name of Saul, who most of you or later on will see that he's called Paul. So three things that we're going to walk away from or that we're going to look at today um, in, this, in this section of the text is we're going to look at the man Stephen. We're going to look at the man Stephen. We're going to look at the aftermath of Stephen's speech. And we'll look at, we'll, we'll, we'll go into some of his speech. But again, that's a, a great detail of reading to do. And I don't want to take up um, the majority of my time reading, or the majority of your time reading. Um, I pray that you all are keeping up in your reading. And if you're behind, that's okay. You can still catch up. But we're going to look at some of that speech. So we're going to look at the aftermath of what Stephen said um, in defense um, to the council. And then lastly, we're going to look at how, or I'll, I'll mention or make mention or show, and you'll see um, here where, how Luke um, take his, takes the focus, is, because up until this point, the focus had been on the apostles and the rest of the disciples, primarily Peter and John, but then we see Peter being the, um, the, the voice uh, the, for the group. And then lastly, we're going to look at, um, somebody's ringing the bell, Lastly, we're going to look at um, we're going to look at how forgive me for that bell. Um, we're going to look at how these texts um, take the focus or the attention off of Luke. I mean, off of Peter and the apostles, and the attention is that Luke's the attention is directed toward the apostle. I mean, toward Stephen. And um, this is where he introduces Saul, who we know later to become. Paul. So let's look at this here. So first we see in these sections, um, let's look at the man Stephen. Let's look at the man Stephen. So here we are in our text in verse 8 of chapter 6. Um, here's what Luke says. He says, Stephen was full of grace and power and was doing great wonders and signs amongst the people. He says, Stephen was full of grace and full of power and was doing great signs amongst the people. Now, Luke pays or brings careful and close attention to the uh, to Stephen. Luke brings careful and close attention to Stephen, and um, in doing this, we see that this is familiar. No, you come on in, have a seat. He bring he makes them familiar. Please close the door. I won't bring you on the camera though. <laughs> Please. <cl> <laughs> So in doing this, Luke brings close attention, um, looking at the man Stephen. And let's look at some of the words that he used. So here in verse 8, uh, Luke says that Stephen is full of grace and power, and he was doing great things amongst the people. And then if you back up a couple of verses, um, back in verse 5 of chapter 6, um, also when we would discuss Stephen about Stephen was part of the nine um, that was chosen amongst the people, who we also discussed that this was the foundation of of where we get the deacon ministry from uh, and, the, the, and the apostles had told the people to go and choose nine men from amongst them who were as full of the spirit. But when we get to Stephen's name, look at what Luke says back in verse five of chapter six. He says, Stephen was a man that was full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And this is the only um, person that in that group of nine that Luke decided that he was going to single out. So it says something about the character of Stephen. And, and here's what we see. So we see that Luke, um, he, 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 he purposely mentions about Stephen that Stephen was a he was full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. He was also full of grace and power. We see that in verse eight. And then thirdly, he was doing great wonders and signs amongst the people. I want to look at the great wonders and signs amongst the people real quick. And, I'll, and then I'll go back and cover the other two, because this language should be familiar to you. This language should be familiar to you. If you can look at my chicken scratch here on the board, back when we were in um, chapter 2, verse 43, look what Luke says about the apostles. He says, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Back in chapter 2, verse 43, go back and review it. He says that many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And here we see here in chapter 6, verse Verse eight, he said they Luke says something similar and very similar about Stephen. He says and Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs amongst the people. Well, how is that? Well, we've already discussed. And again, forgive me if I'm being redundant and I will hammer it in again and again and again and again and again. 
that, yes, the book of Acts primarily covers the acts of the apostles, the 12 apostles, or actually 13 if we um, include Paul, but also behind the scenes, the person that is empowering them to do the things that they're doing, the person that is empowering the church to be effective witness for Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit. Yes, I still have it written up here. So as much as we can call or label the book of Acts um, about the acts of the apostles, it's really the acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. So if we look at chapter two, verse 43, where it reads, it says that many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, where who's really doing the wonders and signs? It's the Holy Spirit. Um, and then likewise, and Stephen was full of grace and power and was doing great wonders and signs amongst the, amongst the people. Well, who was it that was really doing, had the power of working through Stephen? Again, it was the Holy Spirit. And we see the Holy Spirit um, was introduced um, by Jesus in chapter one of the book of Acts. Um, just going back, he tells the disciples that they are to go to wait for the promise or wait in Jerusalem and they will receive power. There it is, power, chapter one, verse eight, um, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts. We see in chapter two, the Holy, the Holy Spirit now comes on scene in his first introduction. The Bible says, Luke records that he comes on the scene and he's like fire of tongues resting on people. And the first thing he gives the people the ability to do is to communicate the wonderful works of God through these 120 people who are up in the upper room to these men who had traveled to Jerusalem from all over over the world. So here we are. So here we are. We see similar with Stephen, like Luke mentioned with the apostles, that he was doing great works and miracles and sign amongst signs amongst the people. I wanted to focus on that real quickly, and I'll move off of it and go to the other points, just to state and to show you that every single one of us as believers that's full of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit empowers us to do signs and wonders. Now, that does not make us musicians, I mean, um, magicians. It doesn't make us warlords. And we don't go off and just do fancy tricks and things of that nature. No, that's not what is after. The Holy Spirit empowers or gives power Power so that people or his people can be effective witnesses for him. Excuse me, someone's going out of the door again, but that should be it. For, um, so that his people could be an effective witness for him. So like the apostles, the Holy Spirit is also now um, doing miraculous works through another individual, through another individual. And I just want to say that to encourage someone and also possibly maybe educate someone as well. And here's where I'm going with that, that the spirit of the Lord or the, and, and also the power or the working of the Lord through people is not reserved for special individuals. You do not have to have a particular rank or a specific title in order for the Holy Spirit to work through you. I'll say that again, you do not have to have obtained a certain rank or receive or, um, um, some type of a special um, uh, uh, recognition or some type of a special title in order for the Holy Spirit to work through you. Likewise, you don't have to have any of those titles to be filled with the Holy Spirit. A, if you are a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, you and you've accepted him in, in your heart, you are saved, and not only are you saved, you are filled with his Spirit. And likewise, you do not have to obtain a particular title and or rank for the Holy Spirit to work through you. Later, Paul talks about in Corinthians that the Spirit gives gifts to whom he sees fit. And all of this is for the overall functioning of the body. And we see Stephen, this, this deacon, even though the word is not used here, this was the foundational principle for the, uh, for the deacon. And we find this first in chapter six of the book of Acts, that here it is that the Holy Spirit through Stephen, not only is Stephen a man of, full of faith, he has the Holy Spirit. Uh, Stephen is full of grace and power. And we see Stephen is singled out here where Luke says that he is doing great wonders and signs amongst the people. Mouthful. I'm sorry. I just had to go there for a second. And again, I pray that that encourages 
uh, someone or anyone who or is listening or may listen later that the Holy Spirit can use you without you having a particular title or have reached some rank. The Holy Spirit gives gifts or he used those or he, as he sees um, fit. Um, so the Holy Spirit was not just reserved to the apostles, if that's your question. Um, the Holy Spirit um, was given to all of the believers and the Holy Spirit worked his powers through whom he saw fit. So it was not just reserved for a particular group. We see that later on, um, James said that God is not a respecter of person. Um, well, no, that's another text, but the Bible, James tells us that we are not to show respect to certain people because of um, particular ranks or social class as they were doing um, in Jerusalem at the time of James. Whole other subject, but likewise, um, the Lord uses who the Lord chooses to use. And I hope um, that helps someone um, today. And likewise, um, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. So yes, um, the man Stephen, the first thing um, that we're looking at here is that, um, again, just, just, just reiterating that Stephen was a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Um, Luke says that in chapter 6, verse 5. Um, and then, um, and, and, and he was singled out out of the other eight with that. Um, now let's look at that. He was a man full of faith. Does that mean that uh, Stephen had more faith than some of the other brothers? Um, maybe, maybe not. Maybe, uh, maybe only in the sense of because they, they, I think that there has to be uh, some type of common level of faith that we all share. I think that's a better way of saying it. there is a common level of faith that we all share. And that first faith is or that first common level, um, for lack of better words here, would be that I think that we all um, as believers, there's there's a commonality that we can always go back and we can revert to um, that we can meet one, each one of uh, one another at as far as being on the equal playing field and that is that we all believe we all believe we all believe that jesus christ is lord we all believe that jesus died for us we all believe that he uh, resurrected from the grave we all believe that he ascended into heaven that right there is the prerequisite for the gospel and if you are someone that you um, have not come to that belief yet and you call yourself a believer um, I would recommend um, that you do some checks and balances uh, um, as far as your faith in the Lord is concerned, because that there is the prerequisite for us uh, becoming Christians. So with that being said, um, uh, um, not Luke, um, Stephen, like the other eight that were chosen um, in chapter six, they all share a commonality um, that they were had faith in this new way or this new teaching um, because they had not um, called themselves Christians yet, but they had this faith or this belief in the Lord Jesus and the gospel. So I think that there was a common playing field with that. But one thing that we can kind of that it would be safe to assume, um, and, and I say that lightly, that it would be safe to assume that it is quite possible that even in their faith in the Lord Jesus, that Stephen may have been, and even if it was by the choosing of the Holy Spirit, Stephen may have stood out from amongst the other eight as far as um, executing um, his faith or, um, yeah, that's what I'm after. He may have stood out from the from the rest as, as far as his execution of his faith or his showing of his faith it's kind of sort of like um peter kind of sort of like peter um peter catches a lot of bad slack um he catches a lot of slack for you know things that he did um from the times um when jesus was walking with them on earth um and then even you know for a little while even after jesus um had resurrected but what we the one thing that we do see about Peter that Peter was always willing to um, show uh, his faith in the Lord Jesus even those times where he failed so Peter often became the voice in the Gospels for the rest of the group and even here in the book of Acts Peter is still the voice um, that we hear um, through these texts and not that the other people did not have a voice and not that the other people did not contribute to the ministry of Christ because we see many of things that the people did but for whatever reason Peter was kind of singled out and likewise here we see Stephen singled out 
And for no other reason, we believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, that the Bible is the inspired word of God. So even though the book of Acts was written by Luke, we believe that the Lord himself, through the Holy Spirit, inspired Luke to write these things. So we can, at, at, again, we can find some commonality of belief in this. For whatever reason, Stephen is singled out. We know that this is solely inspired by the Holy Spirit where Luke is actually writing. So the Lord wants us to see something that Stephen was a man of faith and of the Holy Spirit. He was full of grace and full of power. And like the apostles mentioned in chapter two here, um, that the Lord himself, the whole, through by way of the Holy Spirit, had empowered Stephen to do um, great wonders and signs among the people. So that's pretty much what we see here about the man Stephen. And the people would have recognized this. The people would have recognized this about him. Because remember, uh, looking back to last week and going up earlier in some of these verses, we see here that when they had summoned the apostles because of an issue that was going on with the Hellenists, as we spoke about last week, um, what does the apostles tell them? The apostles tell them to go out and pick out from among you. And that's verse three of chapter six. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, um, full of the spirit and of wisdom who we will appoint this duty. Um, so what do we see here? So it was the people that had chosen Stephen. How or why would they have done that? Because Stephen obviously had displayed some of these characteristics um, in the midst of the people. So we see Stephen full of grace and power was doing great signs and wonders amongst the people. Let's look at verse nine. Let's move off of that real quick. Um, Cause I'll state it. I mean, that's just enough all within itself. That's a, a whole teaching by itself, the teaching in the sense of we all claim, I was supposed to be moving on that we, that we all wear and um, claim this badge of being a Christian. We all uh, wear and we like to say that we have faith and we will dispute amongst each other and others about how great our faith is. But um, what would those who see you on a day to day basis um, the, from the people um, in your church community? And I think that we all um, somewhat know how to act in church and know how to put on a show in front of in front of one another in church. But even still, there is some characteristics um, things that and, and integrity when we start looking at that um, you know what would what would your peers what would you what would your church members say about you as far as you being a person that displays his faith is it just words or do they see your faith being displayed in deeds as well um, when you go to your homes what would your family have to say about you um, are, 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 do you act one way when you're at church and act a different at home or do you display the same characteristics um, even at home what would the people in your community your neighborhood um, are you like a, a active Christian in your neighborhood that if we if someone was to go to your to your home and ask your neighbors like are you showing brotherly and Christian love can people in your neighborhood say that yes he's a devout man of, and has a good reputation and watch this do they even know that you're a Christian in your neighborhood but the point is um, and then also like if we were to go to your jobs if something not me but if someone was to go to your job what would the people um, that you work with um, say to you the people who you come in contact with every day what type of report would they be able to give about you and we see here that Stephen obviously had made or left a lasting and a great impression upon the people that he came across for he was one of the seven that not the apostles chose the people chose and Luke here um, single Stephen out I've said it said it over again single single Stephen out amongst the other group. So it almost as if that Stephen was, you know, he, he stood out amongst the best of them, um, meaning the other eight. So Stephen, full of grace, he performed, here I am again, I'm reading again, I'm sorry, I gotta move off of this. Let's just go to verse nine. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, um, and those who were from the Cyrenians 
and of the Alexandrians and of the uh, Sicilia and Asia rose up and disputed against Stephen. That's verse nine. And then verse 10 says, but they speaking. So there are some other men here some other gentlemen here that's from some of these other synagogues. Now, what the Bible does not tell us is whether or not that Stephen traveled to these synagogues or whether or not these synagogues were visiting, um, if you can say, the main synagogue or the mother synagogue um, or the corporate synagogue, for lack of better words, that was here in Jerusalem. But what we do see that there's some men from other synagogues that were disputing against Stephen. Which also tells us that Stephen, not only, not only, watch this, not only was Stephen um, just another person, just amongst, just hidden amongst the group, Stephen was still going to the synagogue again. And we see this similar to the apostles. And we saw earlier on um, in the book of Acts that they devoted themselves to the teachings and the prayers and that they went to the synagogue every day. So here's some of the things that we can still see about the man Stephen, that Stephen still was going back and forth to the synagogue. But what do we see? What was he doing in the synagogue? Stephen was disputing men from all over the world. Now it is safe to assume and we'll see this later, that what was Stephen doing in the synagogue? Stephen was doing the exact same thing that Peter and John was doing in some of the earlier chapters, the same thing that they were arrested for, because watch this. They were disputing in the synagogue. Now, I'm also sure um, looking at Peter's, not Peter, but Stephen's um, argument um, or his defense against the council, probably was discuss, discussing some things of the law as well and like Peter and the other apostles and like Stephen here and like Jesus more than likely they were discussing the law discussing the law and showing how the law itself was a shadow of this Jesus who had now who had come and had now been put to death and, and had resurrected so because we see that there's some tension building but out of all of these people too I also want to look at these groups um, that that came and if you can see um, my little silly map um, here behind me to my right here which is probably to your left um, there was a group of people here that we see that they were from the, the, the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians. I don't know if Cyrenia and Alexandria is up there, um, but this, this is what I want to point out. The Alexandrians and those from Sicilia um, rose up against Stephen. It's important that we um, note about Sicilia here um, because it is right here. It is right here. And Sicilia is a city of a town or a place called Tarsus, Tarsus. And that's key there. And I see why Luke adds that there, because um, in another chapter or so, when we get to verse eight, um, actually at the end of chapter seven, we're going to be introduced to a gentleman um, named Saul, named Saul. And Saul was from this city of Tarsus this city of Tarsus. So it's those little details that is thrown in here that again, Luke is using um, certain things to introduce a new character and this new character is gonna be Saul. So now we would see possibly why Saul would have some involvement with the stoning of Stephen. Um, and, I, and I'm getting ahead of myself. Yes, he is gonna be stoned at the end of chapter seven, which segues us or opens the door to chapter eight, verse one about this persecution that arose against the church in Jerusalem, which forced them to scatter throughout the regions. And that's how the gospel began to spread. But here it is that there were some men that was there that disputed against Stephen. Um, and they were from Sicilia, which is a city of Tarsus. I wanted to throw that out there. It's, it's right there. That's why it's so important that we don't just, um, I, I am so happy and encouraged that um, from some of you all's phone calls, emails, and texts um, with your questions and discussions about the Bible studies, it is very, very encouraging to me 
um, to know that, that, I, that, that I'm hearing from the Lord correctly and just maybe encouraging um, some who have not done so just to read their Bibles and some are reading more who was reading already. You all are asking great questions. It means that you're paying attention. But now that we're starting to get in the groove of reading, let's look at some of these details because some of these minor details that we um, think is minor are actually huge because it brings context to other stuff so that we see that Paul, Saul, later known as Paul, comes from that city of Sicilia. So here we see that in verse nine, that these men arose um, and began to oppose um, Stephen and they were debating. But verse 10 says, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen was speaking, that they could not understand, they could not um, dispute the wisdom and the spirit that um, in which Stephen was speaking, which I want to pause right there and let's, I, I want to say a few, a couple of things here that Stephen was a man of great wisdom. Luke describes him as a man of great faith, um, full of the Holy Spirit, um, a man full of grace and power. He was doing great miracles. And now we see something else about Stephen, that Stephen was full of wisdom. But why didn't Luke say that Stephen, um, through the wisdom of the spirit, which I do believe what I'm getting ready to say, I'm not saying that uh, Stephen's wisdom uh, superseded the Holy Spirit's wisdom. But Luke um, purposely says that he was full of wisdom and of the spirit. Just by looking at this story thus far and even just looking ahead, it would be safe to suggest that Stephen was very learned or very educated in the things of the law or the things of God, because the law is of God. Peter was very um, educated um, within the things of God. So Peter, I keep saying Peter. So Stephen had wisdom. Stephen had wisdom and Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. So they could not withstand the wisdom, withstand the wisdom and the spirit in which he was speaking. They could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit. They could not um, stand up against Stephen. Now, I am fully um, I, I am in full belief that it was through the spirit and the power of the wisdom that would um, make Stephen so um, effective in what he was doing but there also had to be something there for Stephen to work with and what is my point in saying all of this yes I do today believe in the power and the working of the Holy Spirit I am I am a full belief of that but one of the things that Jesus says about the Holy Spirit is that he will bring all things to your remembrance and then we know Paul talks about the wisdom and the mind of God but I say all that to say that that is the part that God does in us. And likewise, there is a part that we have to do in us. And what we have to do is we have to study to show ourselves approved as a workman before God that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing or rightly handling the word of truth. There is a part or a, a part that God will do, and God through his spirit will give us power. He will give us godly wisdom and understanding concerning his word and all of those things. I mean, but God, it's not just like this. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm a movie buff, but it's not just like the Matrix where we just hook ourselves up and we're just downloaded all of this information all of a sudden. Now, if God wanted to do that, God can. And if God does something like that, that is more of the exception and versus the rule. You and I have an obligation that we are to become students of his word. We are to become students of his word. So like um, Stephen, who was uh, very knowledgeable of the law, he had to do some studying. He spent the lifestyle that was dedicated to learning the, 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 the Mosaic law and the Jewish custom and those things. And we'll see this. I'm not going to read it, but it, please spend time. Read all of chapter seven, because in Stephen's speech or Stephen's defense against the council, Stephen goes all the way back to Abraham and he gives Israel's history and Abraham's conversation with God and what God did. And he talks about the, Abra the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is a real thing. He discusses the Abrahamic covenant 
that the Jews would have understood. He, and he goes and he moves from Abraham and he moves to Moses. No, he, I, no I, I skipped. He moved from Abraham and he sp spoke about the sons and he spoke about Jacob and he spoke about the 12 patriarchs who were the 12 tribes of Israel and how they ended up and how they betrayed their brother Joseph and how they ended up in Egypt and how there was a Pharaoh um, and, and how Joseph became um, and how the Lord put him in charge of Pharaoh's kingdom in Egypt and then how that Pharaoh died and another Pharaoh arose that did not know Joseph and how he oppressed these people of Israel for 400 years which God had promised and said it was going to happen and then he introduces Moses and how Moses um, from Moses' birth to Moses to when Moses to when God put Moses in power and he moves on from Moses to the to, to, to the uh, 40 years in the desert and he moves on from there to David and then from David to Jesus so we can read in chapter 7 that um, Stephen was very knowledgeable about Israel's history he was very knowledgeable about the law, which is ultimately what they accused him of blaspheming against. But I say all of that to say that we have to do our part. That was a mouthful, and I just went the long way just to say that we have to do our part in making ourselves knowledgeable about God's word. And then it is God that will give us this divine wisdom and insight to those things that we read. But we got to give them something to work with. We just don't plug ourselves up to some spiritual computer. And I use the matrix as a little silly example where just information is just going to be downloaded to you. Like, no, you have to bring something to the table. What do you bring yourself and this and actually read it? And then the Holy Spirit will give us divine wisdom and insight. I just want to point that out. So now. And this, is, and, and this is still relevant today. So the Bible says that we would always be able and, um, to, and ready to give an answer or to give an account. So what it is here, we see Stephen is disputing against these scholars, probably from all of these different synagogues, but they could not, they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit in which he was speaking. He had two things. He had wisdom and he had the spirit. Gosh, that's powerful. Verse 11. So what did they do? Because they could not stand up to his knowledge and they couldn't definitely could. Nobody can stand up to the Holy Spirit. And we can see your Bible should have a capital S. So it wasn't talking about a lower spirit. It was the Holy Spirit. Verse 11 says, so therefore they secretly instigated men. Who said we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And because of that, they stirred up the whole people and the elders and the scribes came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. We discussed the council um, a couple of weeks ago. It was the same council that Peter and the apostles had to go in front of, um, and it was the Sanhedrin. It was the Sanhedrin, and we are look at, um, it was either last week's message or the week before. You can go back up and pull that video up and where we discussed the council and who they were and what powers that they had and why they were able to do some of the things that they did. So what did they do? Um, again, so now Peter has to go to, I mean, not Peter, gosh, Stephen has to go to court, just like Peter and the rest of the guys did. Stephen has to go to court. He has to go to see the council. He was arrested. And the charges was, the charges was that he was speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God. This is what he was charged with. These are the same false accusations that the apostles were charged with. More importantly, these are the same false charges that Jesus was charged with. These guys doesn't even, they don't even, they're not even creative enough to come up with something new. They charge these people with the same thing. But I point that out is that um, just like the apostles um, before Stephen, just like Peter and those guys after they were brought in front of the council and they were whipped and they were flogged and they were sent out from amongst the city and they found it a joy, um, the Bible says that they were found even worthy to uh, suffer um, for the name of Christ. We see likewise, Stephen is going through the same thing for the exact same reason. They're being um, persecuted, not because they said anything wrong. And we see in chapter seven, man, Stephen's uh, account is accurate as far as Israel's history. 
as far as their history. And not one thing did he say was blasphemous against the Holy against Moses or God or against the law in that regard. And we'll talk about why they actually got mad at him in a, in a few minutes here. But what we do see here is that um, because of this, they secretly um, instigated men who brought up false charges against them. Like their Lord, like our Lord, like their teacher, they are, they are literally, this is not anything figuratively that is happening. They are literally suffering and being persecuted. This isn't somebody whispering about them. This isn't somebody making a little sideways joke. They are literally suffering physically. They're being put in jail. They're starting to be whipped and flogged. In Stephen's case, he's going to be stoned here in a few verses. He's going to literally be stoned. He's literally going to be put to death for the suffering of the gospel. This here, um, brothers and sisters, is true persecution. This is true persecution for the sake of the gospel, something that you and I really do not have to experience, especially here in the United States in present time. Now, there are Christians in other countries over the world that are or do experience some similar, um, if not the same type of persecutions where there's places where the gospel is illegal. Bibles are illegal, especially in some of these Islamic countries where Christians that are there have to secretly worship and have to secretly read their Bible. It's against the law in some of these places to actually have a Bible. And if they're caught, I mean, their limbs are being cut off, some of them being put to death, et cetera, et cetera. There are some places where that happened where you and I do not experience that level of persecution here in the United States. So we would have to look and come up with something that would be more accurate um, in relevance on how we may experience uh, some um, levels, if any, of being persecuted for what we believe. Uh, thank God we're fortunate to live in a country where religion within itself is not illegal. So we have the freedom. We have the freedom in this country, I know, um, allows all religions to be practiced here, but we have the freedom here where it is not against the law. And that's what we're looking at as far as if we want to look at persecution from this particular standpoint, where it is not against the law. You cannot go to jail for believing in Jesus. You cannot go to jail for speaking the word of Jesus. You cannot be put in jail for having this Bible or reading it um, and things of that nature. You cannot be put in jail or put to death for coming to your local assemblies and church. We do not experience that level of persecution if we look at what the early church was experiencing. And again, I emphasize that because it is somewhat maybe um, a little, I, I, disrespectful would be a strong word, um, but when we compare um, some of the little trivial things um, that we may go through um, because we say that we believers in comparison to what the early church went through and what Jesus went through. I, that there's nothing that I can think of in my history of living and or being a Christian that would um, even come close to that. Um, so I think that we you know, probably should look at some of the things that we would consider um, like, are we really or what would be considered persecution in regards to what the early church um, went through so that you and I could have this Bible? Um, so and for those of you that may shy away from publicly displaying your faith, um, maybe that would encourage you that there's nothing that anyone that you know could do to you um, today that will equal to the magnitude of persecution that they were going through. So yes, we may lose some friends um, because they live a different lifestyle. Uh, we may even possibly, um, some family members may shun away from us, but it's okay because we serve a live, a living God, a living Christ who will bring us and, uh, and will have triumph over all things um, that we had people that we can look at, we can look at these patriarchs that lived before us that literally gave their life for the sake of the gospel. And at most, you and I probably will have to go through some uneasiness um, 
for the sake of the gospel. And again, that's OK. So here's we. So we are. They brought up false false charges. I keep going down these little rabbit holes and I need to get this. I need to get finished with this. Um, so they brought up false uh, charges. Uh, Stephen went through or had to be brought before the council. Again, we discussed the council already. Um, and here's what they said about against him that a um, that he has broke blasphemous words against Moses and God. Verse 13, um, false witnesses said that this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place being the temple and the law. Um, so the law, Moses and God. And we heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth, going back, they're still talking about Jesus, will destroy this place and will change the customs. Remember, Jesus was accused about destroying the temple. He said, if you destroy this temple, and again, they had no understanding that he was talking about his, him being the temple himself. But he said, if you destroy this temple, I will rebuild it in three days, talking about his resurrection. So now they're we're talking the same thing to Stephen. That's a good place for Stephen. I mean, that's, wow. Just look, Stephen is suffering in the same magnitude that the Lord did. Um, it's gruesome looking at this, but man, what a way to be found worthy. Um, so th they're charging him with the same thing. And th so Annie, they heard him say about this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy uh, this place, this holy place, and change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And then verse 15 says that in gazing at him, the council looked him in his face and said that they saw the, what looks like the face of an angel. Let's real quick, let's, let, let's sprint real quick through chapter seven. Let, let's sprint here through chapter seven. So we see um, in verse one of chapter seven that the high priest um, looked at Stephen and said, are all these things so? Why is it, how is it that he's sitting in front of the high priest or the council? Remember, we talked about the council and the Sanhedrin and the high priest having um, that seat. He was like the president of, or the speaker of the house, for lack of better words, for uh, the Sanhedrin, which was known as the council. And then um, Stephen says, brothers and fathers, and hear me. And it is here, as I already discussed, that Stephen was eloquently um, able to go through Israel's history, starting from Abraham all the way through David, pointing to Christ. A um, Stephen was able to uh, effectively articulate the Abrahamic covenant. He spoke about the Mosaic covenant, and he also spoke about the Davidic covenant. And all of those covenants, ultimately, and I said that on purpose, I hope you all go look them up, he, because they, it is a real thing. He uh, accurately was able to articulate the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and the Davidic covenant. And he discussed the people that played a part in, in the fulfilling of those covenants um, in Israel's history all the way uh, up to David, which all pointed toward Jesus. So please go back and read chapter seven. Go back and read chapter seven because it should point you back to Genesis. Um, and um, most of Genesis... Well, all of, yeah, most of Genesis from Abraham um, through Joseph, but then also it, he discusses the things that was promised to David as well, which you will find in First, Second Samuel, and First and Second Kings as well, um, and Chronicles um, should have some of that stuff in there. But the point is, so then here it is at verse fifty-one of chapter seven. Um, verse fifty-one. And I know I skipped all of that, but verse fifty-one of chapter seven. Here's what really got him in trouble. Here's what really got because I. fathers did saying wow so how is it that he said that you resisted the holy spirit um, as your fathers did looking back at israel's history why because the holy spirit had always been on the scene to some extent whole nother story but as your fathers did verse 52 so that would have been problematic for them that he talked about the old some of the older patriarchs um, in israel's history disobeying the holy spirit which would have been disobeying god problem number one um, Let's prime problem number two, verse 52, which of the prophets your fathers um, did not persecute? So now he's talking about again that your fathers persecuted the prophets. Jesus said the same thing. And 
They killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one. Wow. So he's talking about how the prophets spoke about that Jesus and notice that the righteous one is in all caps. And it was referring to Jesus. Again, these words mirror the exact same thing Jesus said. Whom you have now betrayed and murdered. Again, he's talking about Jesus. Verse 53. You who received the law has delivered by angels. You who received the law, who was delivered by angels, did not keep it. So now he, 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 he turns and he indicts the religious leaders that they themselves have not kept the law. Verse 54, verse 54. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. They ground their teeth at him. But he was full of the spirit. He gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens open and the son of man standing at the right hand of God. Wow. Stephen already knew it was getting ready to happen. And after and I believe that, again, this indictment against the religious leaders and all who was there, again, was inspired by the Holy Spirit. So now what do we see here? And I want to point this out real quick here is that Stephen, now we see he had some type of radicalism about him. We can add this to his character. He was not afraid to be radical. He was not afraid to be different. He was not afraid to be a Christian at a time where Christianity was not popular. As a matter of fact, it was so unpopular that it got you killed. And sometimes, and I, and I want to cautiously say this, that sometimes the Holy Spirit will, he will lead you to be radical in cases where he needs you to be radical. Now, notice that this is one person out of the group. So it's not going to be the whole group that always is going to be radical. But sometimes when we see people amongst our midst that we would try to silence, it, because I'm sure some of the people uh, some of the other Christians at that time would have rather Stephen be quiet. And, but we have to know and we have to be able to discern when there's a time not to be quiet. And we can learn from Stephen here that the Lord used Stephen um, to be radical. There was something about Stephen in his personality where he was not fearful. He was a man of wisdom. He was a man of the spirit. He was full of grace. He had power, but there was also something about him that was not afraid. And he had no fear and he would not um, close in his faith of Jesus Christ and who the Lord Jesus Christ was in him and the things that he known about him. He was not willing to shut that up to make other people comfortable. So much so that the Lord put him on display to show, remember, it says that Stephen was a man of great faith. And now we see why. Because Stephen was not afraid to display his faith, even so much to the point where it ultimately caused him his death. And the Lord, the Holy Spirit, will call for you and I at times where we will be called upon and we need to know when there is time for us to be radical, where it's time for us to be okay with other folks around us not being comfortable. It is times where we have to be the exception and not necessarily follow the rule. Verse 57, but they cried out with a loud voice and they stopped their ears and they rushed together at him. It's the same thing they did to Jesus when Jesus gave his final defense in front of the Sanhedrin. They said that they covered their ears and they yelled out blasphemy. Verse 58, well, at the closing 57, they stopped their ears and they rushed together at him. This is, this is beautiful. This, this, look at 58. Verse 58, they cast him out of the city and stoned him. They took Jesus out of the city. They removed Jesus out of the city and they hung him on a cross. Look what they did to Stephen. They took Stephen out of the city. Stephen has repeated the exact same words that Jesus repeated, had said uh, Stephen is being charged with the exact same charge that Jesus um, have been charged with. And likewise, they're taking Stephen out of the city just like they did with Jesus. And now what does it say? They cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Remember, I, I, I said that earlier, Luke is introducing Saul from Tarsus. 
these, these men that's from the city of Sicilia. Saul was there when Stephen was stoned. He was there, and, and Saul obviously had some status of some, ex, of some extent, and we'll discuss that at another time on what that status was, but we see that these people, for whatever reason, they come as witnesses, and they lay down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Verse 59, back to Stephen. And as they were stoning Stephen, Stephen called out, Wow, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. It's the same thing that Jesus said to the Father on the cross. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Verse 60, and falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice. Wow, he's mirroring his teacher, our Lord. Look what he says here. Verse 60, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And when he said this, he fell asleep. He cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold these sins against him. Even at his point of death or dying like Jesus, he was still praying and interceding on behalf of the people that were actually putting him to death. What do we know or what can we learn about this man, Stephen? And I'll just reiterate that Stephen was a man of faith full of faith. Let's not just say man of faith. He was a man full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. And out of all of the other, out of the number of nine, of the other eight, the Lord saw fit to single him out so that we can see or display his levels of faith. He was a man full of grace. He was a man full of grace. The Lord had given Stephen grace to do what it was that he was doing. And also he was a man of power. The Lord empowered Stephen to do what he was doing. And Stephen, we don't, we're, not, we're not told exactly what he was doing, but among serving the people with the other eight, he was doing great wonders and signs amongst the people. Stephen, looking at chapter seven, uh, looking at chapter six, Stephen was not only serving the widows who were being overlooked, but Stephen also was displaying great signs and power amongst the people. That is remarkable because a lot of times in our modern day texts, when we've reached or think that we've reached a certain level, and I said something similar to this last week, when we've reached a certain status in the kingdom of God, we kind of think that we're above doing some other things. And we see here one of the great things about Stephen is not only did Stephen um, help serve the widows who were being overlooked. Stephen also was a great disputer or debater um, in the synagogues and the temples. Um, he was a person that um, this is probably a good, this is probably a good point. I never looked at it this way, uh, but Stephen was one of our first apologists one who was able to defend the gospel. And he stood in the temples and he was a defender of the faith. And he had great power and he had great wisdom that none of the other scholars that were in the synagogues and temple could withstand or stand up to the wisdom and the spirit that was in Stephen. So Stephen was very knowledgeable. He was, he was a man full of wisdom. Um, he was a man full of the spirit. Stephen was a radical. Stephen was not fearful. Stephen um, was not willing to silence his faith and his belief and his knowledge and his wisdom in Jesus Christ and was willing to stand up against his opposers and his accusers um, so that he could properly defend the faith. And as I close, as I close, as I close, um, one of the things that I did not mention, so again, or I actually said it, that Stephen was promoted um, with the other eight gentlemen um, by the people. They were chosen by the people, um, appointed by the apostles. Um, but what, I don't know if Stephen knew, maybe he did, maybe he didn't, that his promotion was gonna cause him to be persecuted. Um, his promotion was going to ultimately cause his death. I'll say it again, his promotion was going to cause him to be persecuted. Ultimately, his 
promotion was going to cause him his death. Which reminds me of a Bible verse that said, much is given, therefore much is required. And if there's a takeaway from this today, we have to be very careful when we seek uh, power, for lack of better words, or when we seek promotion um, and things of that nature. Because there is a requirement that comes along with promotion. In Stephen's case, literally, the cost was his life. In Jesus' case, <laughs> it was his life. And Peter and John and, if we, and Paul, who we just got introduced to as Saul, it literally was their life. And there were many other Christians um, in the first, second, third century throughout, history, throughout Christian history that actually became martyrs for the cause of the faith. So sometimes we don't always know what we are asking for. We see Jesus have a, serious, a, a similar conversation with the disciples when they were arguing. Uh, I believe it was John and his brother James about who would sit at the right and the left of him. And he's like, Can you, are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Ultimately talking about his death. And he said that you will drink from this cup because they were ultimately put to death. So we have to be very, very careful about what it is that we seek after. We have to be very, very careful of what it is that we ask the Lord for. Not saying that the Lord won't do what he's going to do with in his will and his own timing. I'm just referring to us seeking after things without enough knowledge um, where we should probably be more like Stephen where if it is God's will and he chooses us, and it is God that finds us worthy, then it's worth more the while in that particular case versus us choosing and seeking after things because we've seen other people do it, or we have some type of a false idea of what it is and what it's not, where ultimately, like I said, um, for Stephen, he literally had to give up his life and figuratively for us, you and I, and there is an, in, within a literal sense where we may not necessarily have to be put to death because of our um, position in God's kingdom, but there is a sacrifice or self-sacrifice where there is a giving up of our lives where some of us will have to give up the luxuries that others may have and um, also we have to give up some of those liberties that others may seem to have anyway as just far as going to and fro with no accountability um, of some sort where some of us have to give our lives and live our life or live a dedicated life to God, which does put some type, uh, some levels of restrictions on the things that we do. Um, that's it um, for today um, or next week. We will discuss chapter eight of the book of Acts. So you still um, have time to catch up in your reading and prayerfully, maybe you've already read ahead. So next week, we will talk about chapter eight or we will discuss chapter eight as Saul uh, ravages the church. And then we're also going to um, talk about Philip. So here it is again that Luke is introducing um, some other characters um, that are doing some works in the early church. Um, chapter nine, he talks about the conversion of Saul, who later becomes Paul. And then chapter 10, the story goes back. Chapter 10 and 11, the story goes back and focuses on Peter 12 discusses Jane and then it's at that point where the rest of the book of Acts focuses on Saul and his missionary journeys which um, is what chapter 8 uh, segues us into because we'll see that um, Peter or not Peter but Stephen here was the first one that was actually put to death through persecution but this forces ultimately forces the gospel um, to be to leave Jerusalem and scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts it's because of that act right there, how you and I today has the gospel and on our maps here. And some of your Bibles probably have maps. You can see all of these particular places. And, and these are primarily Paul's journeys on where the gospel began to spread throughout Asia. That's all I have today. Um, please remember, um, catch up on your reading. In a couple of weeks, we're going to pause for another Q&A session. Again, um, I pray that this is blessing you. It is really blessing me. It caused me to go back and look at um, the book of Acts. And it's just good to read books in its t entirety so we can uh, grasp the whole story and not little sections and pieces. Um, likewise, um, if you would like to give to the Lighthouse on the Pike, um, please go to our website. Uh, it should be at the bottom of your screen, thelighthouseonthepike.org, thelighthouseonthepike.org. 
Um, and then also too, you can start sending your questions in early um, if you don't want to wait to the next Q&A um, and you can email them to me directly at um, or to uh, Pastor G at the Lighthouse on the Pike dot org again that's pastor g at the lighthouse on the pike dot org and our website again is the lighthouse on the pike dot org until next time i'm pastor g grace and peace to you and blessings